Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Rock Talk. This episode of Grok Talk was originally recorded on July 12th, 2014. All the original ads and content remain intact, but it has been edited to fit our new programming format. Excellent. <laughs> He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Dave Booten has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. He voted to raise your gas tax by another 23% taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Putin's vote? Call Senator Putin at 603-203-5391 and tell him that we're on to his wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Are you from New Hampshire? Have you ever been to New Hampshire? Has anyone you've known ever sent you a postcard from New Hampshire? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you too can become one of New Hampshire's very own Little Wandering Voters. Thanks to the Senator Martha Fuller Clark's Home for the Little Wandering Voters Foundation. With your out-of-state voter participation and your liberal contribution, we can help Senator Martha and all her liberal pals stay in office. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Jeb Bradley has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now, Senator Bradley is leading the charge to try and pass a Senate bill to prevent us from criticizing his vote. Call Senator Bradley at 603-569-4208 and tell him that we're on to his wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. Do you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. She tried to make us believe she was a fiscal conservative. But State Senator Nancy Stiles has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, she claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. She voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%, taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how she drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Stiles' vote. Call Senator Stiles at 603-918-0553 and tell her that we're on to her wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell her to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. 
We'd like to welcome you to another edition of Rock Talk, brought to you by GranitRock.com, New Hampshire's conservative website. We are your feared, extremist, right-wing, hard-charging, gun-toting, opinionated, outspoken, rabble-rousing, letter-writing, radio, microphone-stomping, conservatives, and rational libertarians. So get ready for two hours of news and opinion you could only get from GranitRock.com. Rock Talk. All right, we're late starting this week, so we'll be running 9.30 to 11.30 this morning. Welcome to Grok Talk, brought to you by GraniteGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, coming to you live from CNHT in Concord, New Hampshire. It's been a busy week. It's been a crazy week. We are still waiting for keys to get into the building for next week when we do our show. But we're going to start now because we already have our first guest. Senator Bob Smith has joined us to talk about the campaign, and uh, we'd like to welcome you to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was a fine speech you gave uh, Thursday evening at Kevin Avard's uh, fundraiser. I will get that posted. Thank you. Yeah, it was uh, it was fun. It was a good group. Mm-hmm. You always feel uh, guilty talking to people that are th- think just like you do because they're frustrated too. They want to <laughs> they want to make changes and and uh, get us get America back. And you some you really you preach to the choir a lot. That, that's true. So that's a very good question to start up with, uh, Senator. How do you preach to the not choir? How do you reach the rest of them? Well, I think you have to you have to um, start by making people understand that when we stand on principles and what we believe in and what our values are, if you stand on those principles and make it very clear what you stand for and what they stand for on the other side, on the left, mm-hmm. I, I think I think people will. Uh, we'll come. We'll come forth. We'll start winning elections, and we'll get our country back. Well, you know, Rush Limbaugh has the saying, "Conservatism wins every time it's tried," and I'm inclined to agree with that. Uh, if we look at the uh, the senator who is pale brown rather than bold colors, uh, the reason <laughs> all right, Skip. The, 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 re- the reason he lost in 2012 was because he ran away from what he espoused in 2010. Yeah, I walked the streets in 2010. I had folks who said, me and all my Democrat buddies, too. I want somebody that will protect my rights. Yeah. Does that sound like a nearly Democrat t- that they're talking about? <laughs> yeah. No, they wanted a Tea Party candidate. They thought they had one, and they didn't come out for him in 2012. I agree. I mean, uh, you, you're, you alluded to basically the Reagan quote, which is no, no pale pastels but bold colors that make it un- unmistakably clear what we stand for. I that's a- Ronald Reagan, and that's uh, that's me. That's what I want to do. I want to make people understand that it's not about any one of us as a candidate. It's not about Brown or Smith or Rubens. It's about the the American. It's about the, what we stand for as Americans on our side, and uh, what the left stands for: uh, less freedom on the left, more freedom on our side. Less regulation on our side, more mm-hmm. regulation on their side. Go down the line. More gun control on their side. Yeah. Less gun control. No gun control on our side. Well, uh, well, right they, to life. Uh, down the line. All of them. They they want a unitary executive and a administrative state, and they are hell bent on achieving it, and they're getting there faster than we'd like. Well, they're winning, and they're winning because I don't think the American people get a chance in election after election to really see the differences. That's mm-hmm. me. Uh, you have to, you have yeah, to show the differences, who, who we are and who they are. And we're not doing that when we nominate people who okay. have a, a philosophy or a, 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 both a checkered past and a current philosophy of basically being in the middle or not clear mm-hmm. on what they stand for. If you're clear on what you stand for, as Reagan said, and you are bold and you point that out, the people will see it, and at least they can make a choice. Yeah. They can decide they want less freedom or they want more. They want to raise their kids in freedom or raise it with more government control. But that, if I'm the nominee, they're going to know the difference between Shaheen and me in terms of what that, what that, what that issue is. Whether you want you want more freedom, okay, I'm your guy. You want to get you want somebody to tell you what doctor to use or if you can have your own doctor or your own health insurance policy. You want more NSA, NSA spying. Well, yeah. there's your there's your gal. She's right over there. Right, e- exactly. And uh, the, the problem with the uh, the other candidate, who I present in sepia tones uh, to indicate my point, uh, is uh, it, it, is that he's proud of voting for some of the Democrats' worst achievements the last few years, like Dodd Frank. And 
I don't know the last time he said that, but he was saying it until at least a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty bizarre, really. And I, I, th- I think that when you seek the nomination of a particular party, you at least ought to vote with him 50% of the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he doesn't even do that. Uh, but, you know... Look, I mean, you got to be comfortable in your own skin. You got to, you got to, if you're running in a, this is the thing. I'm a platform Republican. I support the Republican platform, period. I don't, I don't make exceptions. And, and if we, and Reagan, think about it. The last time we really had great success and we won was Reagan when we won on principle. Yeah. You knew exactly where the man stood. When he came to work in the morning, if the in basket was empty, he didn't have to go looking around to try to find something to do. He knew what he believed in, and he changed the entire world. Yeah. I mean, he took he, he, he had his wife against him, all of his advisors against him when he went to Reykjavik, and he was told to accept Gorbachev's proposal. Mm-hmm. He did not because he knew that if he, could, if he could bring Gorbachev around to his view, the world would change. And so he bluffed Gorbachev, and Gorbachev thought we had the capacity – uh, you know, with this missile defense shield system, which uh, we were trying to develop but didn't have, but Gorbachev thought we did. So yeah. that's Reagan, and that's where we are. We 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 rise to the challenge. I mean, I'm not. I don't wanna, we're not underachievers here. We are people who believe in something, and we rise to those challenges. Well, he he knew he had the backing of a couple of the top leaders in the world at the time. A pope who knew what he stood for, and a, and a prime minister who knew what she stood oh, for. Oh yeah, they are two of the best. Yes, yeah, sir. I have a question for you. And one I think that is becoming very obvious that there is a large threat to the republic, and that's in the executive branch agencies. We have seen the IRS stonewall Congress's oversight. We have seen them lose documents. We have seen them lose emails in the case of Lois Lerner. We're seeing the same thing with the EPA. We're seeing the same thing with Treasury. We're seeing things with uh, the Department of the Interior. We see it almost in every single instance that any time that Congress is trying to do something, there is almost a willful intent to ignore Congress from the state of the executive branches. When, and I look at that as that is the beginning of tyranny. Because when the executive branch isn't going to play with Congress, because Congress has given them so much power Mm -hmm. that now you can't rein them in, that is tyranny. Because if they can do that to the Senate, if they can do that to the House, they're certainly doing it to us. And we've seen example after example, the IRS being one, the EPA is also... Uh, doing that all the time, and don't forget the devil's spawn of the CIA, of of the Dodd Frank, the Consumer Finance <laughs> Protection Protection Bureau, which now says that it can close down any business, anytime, anywhere, for any reason, and we'll see you in court on our schedule. Meanwhile, you can't do business. And they're yeah. doing it, and they're unaccountable. They're actually doing it. Well, I mean, it's going to. I mean, look at that. that you're ta- I thought you were talking about the regulations under Dodd Frank. Community banks are closing everywhere. That's what I meant. Well, yeah. well yes, but there's a, they've actually claimed the right to issue. Oh, and de- cease and desist orders oh, to sure. businesses, uh, to which uh, my, my answer would be, um, just argue with the other end of this cult, would you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question was going to be, as senator, what will you do to reestablish the balance between the three branches? And how do you rein in all these agencies, given that uh, the executive branch isn't doing what it's supposed to? Congress refuses to use its own power to do that. It refuses, the Republicans refuse to use the most powerful tool that in its disposal, which is you either start uh, impeachment of the executive branch or you yank their money. At this point, what, how do you haul in that run, run away train? Well, it's a, <coughs> excuse me, that's a long and complicated question. But clearly, Congress has oversight responsibility has funding responsibility, the, the, the right to, the responsibility to defund or to fund these, these agencies. And we know historically that there are, when there are weak presidents, uh, Congress tends to rise up and be strong. And when there are strong presidents, Congress tends to fall back. And what we have here, unfortunately, is a case of a president who basically ignores Congress, does whatever he wants to do through executive orders. So I suppose you'd have to say strong in that sense. 
so strong the wrong way. So what what you have to do is, you, first of all, you put you put these. The Congress does hold the purse strings. The president cannot do anything about that, and that's where they've got to exercise Skip. their power. And what they have to do is they've got to come in and they've got to say, okay, uh, we're going to put you at zero base budget. You're going to have to justify what it is that you're doing, mm-hmm. and we're going to start with zero, and we're going to go from there. And if a, and, and and these unconstitutional agencies, such as some of the ones that you were talking about. Defund him, and make him make him come forth and try to and try to defend these agencies without money. You can't. Who is it? It's going to be very difficult okay. to do. Well, so I'm I'm actually very concerned that we've crossed a Rubicon here, and that these agencies uh, cannot be killed. That they will get their well, printed money somehow. Uh, the CFPB, for example, gets its money directly from the Federal Reserve. Here's why I think you're wrong. We, we you're you're correct in the sense that. It, it almost it, it seems like we've crossed the Rubicon, but let's but let's go to the let's go to the reason for that, Skip. Why why have we crossed the Rubicon? Well, because we elect people who continue to allow this to happen. Mm-hmm. Congress has the purse strings. We don't have Congress men and women who have the courage to stop it. That's what we need. And you're not going to stop it if you elect people who are muddy in the middle and not clear so that the American people don't know. If you explain to people that these agencies are doing what they're doing, they are unconstitutional, they are making power grabs, they're doing, regulating us and strangling us in business and other things, make that case, make it clear. If you elect her, Senator Shaheen, you're going to get more of that. If you don't like it, then you have to get her out of office. And that's where we win, and that's the only way we win. All right, we have a caller on the line, Jane Cormier, I believe you said. Yes, sir. Hi, Jane, how you doing? You had a question um, for Senator Smith? You know what, we're talking, uh, I came in kind of late to your um, to your discussion. So did but me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that, yeah. Um, let me ask Senator Smith, what do we, what do, we do about um, all of the bureaucracy that is now entrenched statewide and federally into our communities on a grassroots level what can we do to fight for instance hud coming in and changing zoning laws or epa changing um you know regulations within our communities how do we fight it on that level well i I know i sound like a broken record when i say it but we the people that we elect we're let's stick to the federal side for a moment they are the ones who are allowing this to happen they are the ones that are giving HUD the authority to do this. Congress is not exercising its responsibility. They need to say, when these votes come up to fund HUD, we need to say, this is unconstitutional. It's not, it's not within the confines of the Constitution. It's not lawful. Therefore, we're going to defund you. We're not going to give you the money to, to come in and, 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 and push regulations upon states or, or dangle money in front of states, uh, tempting them to take this program or that program as we saw with Medicaid expansion. Um, and, and therefore, if we do that, we then can pull the plug on this stuff and bring us back to a constitutional republic. But it, it starts with electing the right people to do it. it. There's no other answer. I mean, you can debate these issues until the cows come home, but if you don't change the people who put these, these programs in, you're not going to change the country. And you're not going to do that if you nominate people uh, and, and, and elect, nominate people who run in our party who, as Senator Brown uh, is, who is, you know, Democrat light, who are just going to say, well, we'll massage this here and there, and we, and we, won't, we won't win. Yeah, uh, or, or put as kindly as possible, he sees the failures that are occurring, doesn't ascribe the cause to government, and thinks we must do something, it's because, which is the big failure of Congress overall. It's because they don't – I, I don't want to ascribe anything – personally to Brown, but it's, it's, they don't, when I say they, I mean, people that think like that don't see the big picture. You got to get down to the basics here. People in this country, we have a constitutional Republic. We elect them. We elect them. It's when they get to the point where we don't get a chance to elect people or unelect them, then we got a problem, but we elect them. So therefore, if we elect them, Let's unelect them, and then we make these changes. It's that basic. And I don't think the American people have gotten a connection because we keep nominating people who are 
whatever, rhinos, moderates, call them what you want, but they should have the same positions. I, let me just – you got a minute? Or you go ahead. We're, go? we're just going to take a 60-second break when you're done. I, I'll quickly – you know, look at you. If you're a Republican, ask yourself, do I support the Republican principles or not? If you do, then be bold about it, as Reagan said. He won on those those points. He was a conservative. And no one and everybody thought, Oh, he can't win. He's not even he can't win. He can't be he's never gonna win because he's too conservative. Well he won because he pointed out to the American people, hey, this is America. I'm not gonna sit in the White House with a sweater on and freeze to death and turn the thermostat down. I'm gonna we're gonna find oil. This is America. Rise to the challenge. That's why we won the Second World War. It's why we went through a depression. It's why we went to the moon. Uh, it's why we, you know, we have a Voyager out there in outer space somewhere in another solar system because that's who we are. And that's exactly the attitude that we must face. We cannot withdraw in ourselves. And as uh, frankly, honestly, as uh, Senator Rubin says, you know, that let's not over let's not try strive to overachieve. I'm sorry. That's not who America is. That's not who we are. I mean, I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player. I soon learned I couldn't because I didn't have the ability. <laughs> I also wanted to get into politics. Well, maybe I had a little better ability there. So that's the greatness of America is you can live your dream. That's why we had manifest destiny. And that's why we went from, you know, from the colonies to the West and settled America. It's why we went to the moon. It's why we did all these things because that's who we are. We accept bold challenges and, and move forward. And that's all we have to do here is just accept these as challenges and move forward and elect the right people. All right, we're going to take 60 seconds. We'll be right back with Senator Smith. Talk. All right, we are back with Senator Bob Smith running in a Republican primary to challenge Gene Shaheen. So that was a good way to go in a break. I don't know where we go from here. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about whether you can, in fact, close down these agencies. It reminds me more and more every day of Yes Minister, where the uh, the agency is in control, and no matter who you appoint or who you elect, they're just figureheads. And that cannot stand in this constitutional Actually, republic. Actually, one of the things that Senator Smith said, to I, first, I think our first phone interview, was we were talking about term limits. And you had said, you know, if you don't get rid of all the staffers and these bureaucrats that are running around controlling all the people who get elected to office, it's really kind of a waste of time. So I talk about that all the time on Facebook and stuff, whenever anybody brings it up, and I go, well, you know, Senator Smith told me, if you, and it's true, the staffers, I mean, a lot of these staffers, they're just there managing these candidates. Well, well it's true. They, they, they move from one office to the other. When the candidate leaves, they just go to another office. These are career bureaucrats, if you will. Tied to the money. Tied Washington. to the money. They're, they're bright people, but they're usually the wrong political views. And... Uh, if we, if you impose term limits on conservatives and and not on the left, the left's going to continue to win. We're going to continue to take our own people out of office. I think that the only, and I'd have a debate on term limits. But I think the only thing about term limits is, is that in that in that situation, um, you you don't want to take the power. You don't want to remove the power from the people. We want participation in in the political process. I want people to say, I don't like that guy, or I like that guy, and I want to vote. I want to get involved. Whereas if you take term, oh, well, he's going to be gone in six years or 12 years or eight years, whatever. And why bother? You know, we'll just let him stay there. And you're, and you say you kind of tune out. And I want people tuned in and on and getting and getting involved in a political process. And, and, and you can remove a, a candidate or a po- politician anytime you want to. Here's a question that I should ask all of the candidates. And that is, would you support returning the appointment of senators to state legislators? Well, that's an interesting question and, and one that uh, – would change a lot of this uh, money situation in politics. I haven't, I haven't taken a position on it. I'm going to stay neutral on it right now. But you know what? Um, the, the founding fathers were right more than they were wrong. We're finding that out, and um, the the purpose of that was to was to have that control, to have to have the because it is a United States of America. They 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 would have the control. The, the legislatures would have the control over who those senators were and who and who got elected. The other side of it is you could have the same political influence now dropping from the U.S. senators down to the state legislators. You'd have to be careful that the same pressures weren't put on them, which would basically not solve the problem. So a little harder to question. do here in New Hampshire with 400 of them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> I mean, true. I, and I understand why Steve's asking the question, because from the bottom looking back up, we see that the senators have just become 
just glorified house reps. Longer terms, a little bit better money. Right. The 17th Amendment took away the state's interest, which was supposed to be that breaking mechanism on That's the true. House of Representatives. So you see things like Obamacare passing because they're just other, uh, all due respect, they're just other politicians versus actually representing the state of these United States. Right. That's true. Uh, on, the, on the other side as well, uh, sometimes depending on the, com- the committees you represent, for example, uh, I, I didn't serve as the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, but I was a 12-year member of the Armed Services Committee. You do have issues that come up that go far beyond the borders of New Hampshire Correct. that you have to deal with, national interest, right. national security. And, that, and that's a given. Right. So as long as you protect that, uh, then, and you, but, but the fact that you're tied to the state is a good thing. Because you you then uh, you you have to you understand that your power base is from the state legislature, which is elected by the people of New Hampshire. Um, so you know, very powerful case. I I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I'm very much a fundamentalist on the Constitution and yeah. the uh, original founding fathers, and and uh, so I, I like. Uh, I like what they wrote. I always get fascinated by the fact that people say, well, Madison meant this. Then I read what Madison said. I was, Here's what he said, you know. Yeah, and, and, exactly. And, you know, progressives since the end of the uh, 19th century have wanted to do away with upper houses of parliaments. Uh, Hitler did so because he didn't want the, uh, the states of Germany to have any influence. Uh, the British progressives uh, are constantly trying to dumb down the House of Lords because they don't want any impediment to mob rule. And a th- Essentially, that's what's being done here. And with the best will in the world, and you're not one of them, our senators are mostly bought and paid for on a national basis, not, well, you know, on, not on a local basis. And, and they are. You know, the thing is, I don't, I don't want to say like I'm the only guy, the only good guy here. But, I mean, I, I passed all that up deliberately. I didn't, I didn't take a lobbying job. It is a revolving door. It's incestual. Uh, you know, it, it's like the, the, this thing, the story out there now about the $150 million on breast cancer that Senator Sheen either voted for or, or promoted. I don't know what the situation is. I'm not making any accusations, but it's just the perception. Her husband is an investor in the company that gets some of the money. I mean, this is, as I say, I I don't know what happened. I'm not making any accusations against Senator Shaheen on that. But the point is, it's the perception that's out there that everything just goes around and that everybody's in there for profit and it's not for, you know, for the cause. And and but, you know, if I could just quickly uh, on your point about the senators, Go back to the Electoral College. Look how uh, you talk about bastardizing something. Oh, I mean, yes. the Electoral College, the spirit and tenor of the Electoral College has been so 180 degree changed. I mean, the, 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 if we were to go back to the original intent of that, we'd change the, all this money in politics, would go away. Because the electors would go in secretly, cast their votes for two people, one in their state if they want to. And one outside of their state. They can't vote for two people within their state. It could be anybody. No one knows until you open the ballots on December 12th or whatever the date is in December. Then you know who the president is. And it could be a, a scientist. It could be a, anybody that it could not have to be out there running for president, spending hundreds of millions of dollars. It could be anybody. And that's, that would be – if we go back to that system, that would be – that would change things dramatically in this country. We get a lot better candidates, too. Uh, and, un- Just, and unfortunately, they want to go the other way and make it into a national popular vote. Exactly, which, po- which is wrong. That's uh, which, not what the, what the founders meant. At which point you have top-to-bottom mob rule democracy, and you don't even have any essence of first-past-the-post, head of the largest party, or any of those things like you have in a prime ministership. Right. It, it, it's a pure mob rule. Skip, sorry. Well, yeah. I'm sorry. I was yeah. gonna, well, uh, you're talking about the revolving door. Glenn Reynolds, who runs one of the biggest uh, – blog sites in the internet, uh, Instapundit, has a perfect solution to that. If you leave government and you go to the private sector in that revolving door, 50% of anything you earn immediately is taken away by taxes at the federal level. <laughs> and that will, that will that kind of stop solve, it. that might stop some of that. Uh, I know that we're getting near the end of our segment. With Two you. minutes. We appreciate it. Where are you going to be heading after this? Because I think it's a very important thing that you're going to. We are going to the Benghazi uh, rally. I, it is very important, and it's a prime example of a real outrage in terms of this administration and the way this issue has been treated or not treated, uh, where people who's lost loved ones, patriotic loved ones, who uh, just no answers, and uh, especially those guys that defended the ambassador who were killed with calling for help and got no help. 
and their their families can't even get answers in the way that's been treated with basically the administration thumbing their nose at them is is a disgrace it's a national disgrace just like the VA scandal is a disgrace and all and the NASA, NSA spying is a disgrace and the they, border and then the border is another yeah. disgrace what, what what about the uh, are you going to attend the uh, candlelight vigil tonight i believe there's i think it's i think it's this evening uh, the, the remember Benghazi folks, Lou Milanese and those guys. I don't. I don't know. I know we're going to a, a rally. I think at twelve o'clock. Oh, maybe uh, it is noon. Hang on. Yeah, I think that may be it. I'm not sure. Well, it go, it goes back uh, everything that you said. A bureaucracy that openly plots to overcome Congress's oversight is an honest to God threat to the republic. I mean, that's that sums it, it up. And I'm hoping that if you get there, I'm hoping that if any of our Republican senators get the seat, that that's going to be one of the biggest things to do is to shrink that up so that they can't do that again though and i totally agree and it and and it's as you said earlier skip right mike mike i'm mike, sorry I'm mike. You guys, he's, he's skip we're not, we all mike. look alike we're not i was mike. at mike's house the other day and somebody called me skip so it's okay <laughs> got about uh, 20 seconds uh well we, it, how to reach you the, all right uh bob smith for us senate.com and, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you elect me out, you'll know the difference between the two of us. And I will make every effort to do what I can do to make these agencies responsible. I'd like to eliminate a lot of them. Let's put it directly. Yay. Oh, I like that. I bet you can remember which ones you want to eliminate. Oh, too. I can make the list. I, <laughs> unlike, the, unlike the governor. I, I felt well, so we'll bad We'll have to him. do a different segment for that list. But thank if you I'd so been much standing for coming there, down. I would have said, here and here, here the other, here's the other, here's the other. <laughs> Oh, All right. I don't think he'd do that again. All right, so that's the segment. We'll be back with Matt Murphy from Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire, if I can say it. This is Grok Talk, and we'll be right back. Grok Talk. Just shaking the senator's hand as he exits the studio. Welcome back to Grok Talk. My name is Steve McDonald. I am here with Skip Murphy. And Mike Rogers coming to you live from 8 North Main Street, Concord, New Hampshire, Grassroots Central. CNHT is where we are. Visit cnht.org. See what they do. Make a donation. They do need more money than just from the picnic that we were at last week. And you want to keep them going so they can be doing the things they can be doing. And we can be here in this office <laughs> giving you a program. So uh, welcome back, gentlemen. Um, we are ready for our second segment. And our next guest is Matt Murphy from Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Matt, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, guys. Great to have you in there. So um, why don't you start by telling us what Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire does, and then we'll move on to issues. Well, uh, Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire is a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, issue advocacy group, and uh, we've been very active this year at, in, the, in Concord and keeping uh, people informed of, of what they're doing at the State House and, and what our federal delegation is doing in Washington. And uh, it's obvious because we we run your PSAs during the show, and it certainly sounds and, and looks like you guys are becoming very pointed in your criticisms of those that you think are not helping the cause of making a, a stronger New Hampshire for all of us citizens and residents. We are we are definitely pointing out where where people are, are hurting our economy. I think, uh, as you'll see, our, our biggest issue is the this gas tax. Um, that we passed the four, the 23 percent increase that we passed at the state level, and now they're kicking around the idea of of what looks to be a 33 percent increase at the federal level. Um, so that's been our focus. Obviously, Medicaid expansion uh, we've been very engaged on, and, and there's several other issues, uh, both in Washington and Concord, that we, we continue to be focused on, and uh, we'll continue educating people about that don't have the time to, to go up to Concord and sit in hearings. And would you like to share any? What, what are the hot issues? I know we talked about the gas tax and Medicaid expansion. What else do you see from um, your position um, that's, that's coming up, maybe things that we're going to deal with in the next session that we're going to want to pay attention to? Well, I think, you know, we still have uh, this SB 120 um, that, that is sitting on uh, Terry Norelli's desk, has been there for about 36 days. Um, which limits the ability of, of groups like Strong New Hampshire uh, to exercise their First Amendment rights and to educate voters. Um, so that, that's going to be a hot issue coming up. Uh, I think 
as we as we move into the next legislative session, um, we were very active on uh, Second Amendment bills. Uh, I don't know if you remember the. I believe it was 1584, um, where or 1589, excuse me, where they wanted to, uh, to have us uh, do a transfer for all or a, a, go to a gun dealer for all transfers of private sales for firearms. Or uh, so basically, if I wanted to give a firearm to a relative, even if it was just to to loan him the firearm to go hunting, I would have to go and, and get a transfer uh, through a FFL or a federally uh, licensed firearm agent and and, and get, transfer him the firearm legally uh, to be able to to, to do that. So, it is fifteen eighty nine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. Well, when you when you have all those bills, sometimes that you forget mm-hmm. those numbers. But um, I mean, that those are going to be the key issues, and I think you know that, that that's always been what we focused on is fiscal issues. Um, Any time that, that, that you know we're talking about increasing a tax, I mean, look at look at the session we had, the surplus that they put right back into to the health and human services. They increased. They had a passed a paint tax. I don't know if you recall that. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they put a tax on, on the sale of, of paint. So now, you know, if you paint your house, which nobody looks forward to, it just costs you a little bit more. Um, I mean, we had the gas tax. Um, we're seeing now that, that Medicaid expansion is is uh, going to be a bigger problem. I don't know if you saw yesterday there was a, a press release that came out that the numbers that the Lewin Group – um, who thought we're going to sign up for Medicaid expansion has has way surpassed what they thought was going to sign up for, for Medicaid. Big surprise. Yes. Um, and, and so those are the issues that we're, we're going to keep educating people on uh, and make sure they, they, they understand how this is going to impact them at the state level. At the federal level, I mean, we're going to keep beating the drum about Obamacare. Um, we're going to keep holding uh, Senator Shaheen accountable on what she's going to do on the, the gas tax. Um, I don't know if you saw the back and forth where she said, well, uh, I don't support the gas tax, but I do support the gas tax, and it depends really who she's talking to. Correct. Hey, um, i got a question for you. Um, uh, you said that Terry Norelli, the Speaker of the House, who will be retiring, um, is holding on to SB 120. That was the bill uh, premised by the New Hampshire State uh, Senate Republicans, and I'm going to bring that up again, the rogue Republicans, <coughs> who Scuttlebutt says that they did the Democrats' dirty work to silence ordinary citizens like us because they got tired of being whacked around by other people. You know, Granite Rock fought the Mini Disclose Act written by Kathy Sullivan several years ago, and here's the Republicans doing the exact same thing. But do you think that she's going to hold on to that because of what the Democrats are trying to do in at the federal level in D.C. in trying to modify the First Amendment so that they will control all political spending? Um, I, I don't know what the reasoning is behind it. Um but the, the, the part that kind of boggles my mind, and I don't buy into this argument, but I, what, during the during the, the hearing process and in the public statements of those that supported this, they made it, and they you know the the crisis alert went out that this was so important that it needed to be done immediately. Well, I mean, what's with the delay? And I think part of it is that I think. That part of it is that the they want to see what Washington does, um, but other than that, I, there's no explanation for why they're doing this, uh, why she's holding it on her desk, um, and why it's why it hasn't gone to the governor. You know, I look at the same thing, uh, or with the same jaded eye as the the buffer bills, where we told the Senate Republicans. Don't do this bill, which would provide the 25-foot buffer at abortion clinics for people who are trying to help those mothers uh, to be. Look, it's coming to the U.S. Supreme Court because of the Massachusetts buffer role uh, or uh, um, the buffer, whatever oh, yeah. it's called. Yeah. So, But they went and did it anyways, and now they, they've just had to say, well, we can't enforce it. But it's still on the books because, you know, here we're being controlled 
by DC. Yeah, and it's it's a symptomatic of of people, and I think that you know the same thing with 120. I mean, we have a a, a situation where where campaign finance right now is an ongoing topic. And, you know, with Citizens United, and that was a great decision, I think that, that was protecting free speech. And, and with all these decisions that we're seeing uh, where the defense of free speech is being upheld by the courts, um, I think they're trying to be reactive. And that was one of the reasons when we sp- spoke with Senator Bradley and, and some of the other sponsors like uh, Representative Jasper was one of the things that we said was, well, wait a minute, hold on. This is an issue already decided. These groups are doing, you know, they're doing issue advocacy, which is completely different than, you know, going after. I I think this is, and I think you guys properly labeled it, this is the Incumbent Protection Act. And Racketeering Act. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The full full name being the New Hampshire State Senate uh, Incumbency Protection and Racketeering Act. Right. And and this was really what it is, is groups like ours, you know, groups like Granite Rock, groups like Cornerstone and AFP, all we're trying to do is is cut through the smoke and mirrors. I mean, as you guys know, to sit up in Concord is a full-time job and try to figure out what they're doing. And, and, you know, with people that that own businesses and are on the road and and can't pay attention and, and... or, or are too busy running their, their daily lives to pay attention. That's all we're doing is trying to let people know exactly who, what, when, and where, and how it's going to affect them. Um, and that's that's really what we're up there trying to, to protect and give these people a voice in, in, in Concord. You know, I, I'm looking for the article I just posted, but there's some group in New Hampshire that's trying to get campaign money out of politics, and I found it funny that oh, they do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, elastic group, but they they do this by getting campaign money to promote their issue, which I think is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, mean, it, I mean, money is the mother's milk of politics, and I, th- I mean, the Supreme Court has been very clear that that money is speech. I mean, and, and as we know, I mean, all of us who've dealt with this issue is you can't you can't effectively communicate in a mass. Of, in a massive, mass public communications way without having the money behind it to be able to, to do the radio ads and, and those type of things to educate. I mean, there's just no effective way. So to take money out of politics is like taking, taking base out of baseballs, you know? <laughs> well, I, 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 one of the things I wrote was if, if money isn't speech and politics, then I think every politician should just give up all their money and then see how that works out for right. them because they can't possibly speak without it. Right. Well, unless you're, you know, Ann Custer and you use all your franking money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that has it's, been a bit. It, it's still money, though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, she was she was so worried about communicating with constituents, she has not not held one town hall during her whole tenure. <laughs> that's uh, that's quite an important point that our listeners need to share with their friends and neighbors that Ann Custer, the Obama clone, isn't. Well, holding home. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Holding town halls. Sorry. <laughs> well, and, and, that, and that's really what it is, and that's really what we're trying to educate people is, is that you know these people, whether they're you know whether they're they're Republican or Democrat, you, you have to be able to answer to the people that you serve. I mean, we have Obamacare that that's become a, a massive drain on the economy. Um, we have the Keystone Pipeline issue. We have Benghazi. We have IRS targeting. We have all these issues. And Ian Custer, Carol Shea Porter, Gene Shaheen, they, they, they haven't held one town hall meeting to get people opinion on it. They don't want to hear about it. They just want to, the only time they want to do events is in controlled areas. And I, I think... Uh, Carol Shea Porter, the last time she did a hot town hall was Rochester, New Hampshire, inside a private nursing home. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Where they would not allow uh, cameras in. And nobody was allowed to turn up their hearing aids. <laughs> I don't know because I was forced to sit outside. But Of course. Um, 
uh, you know, that was that was the situation there. But I mean, it's a sham. I mean, we have serious issues. None of them have to, had to defend their their stance or support for these issues publicly. Um, and it's it's we deserve better. Um, and, and that's what we're we're trying to educate folks on is is exactly where they stand and what they're doing. All right, Matt, hang on for 60 seconds. We're going to take a a commercial that you're going to recognize, and we'll be right back with Matt Murphy from Citizens First New Hampshire. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Jeb Bradley has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now, Senator Bradley is leading the charge to try and pass a Senate bill to prevent us from criticizing his vote. Call Senator Bradley at 603-569-4208 and tell him that we're on to his wolf in sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Rock Dog. All right, we are back with Matt Murphy from Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. I'm Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers. Uh, we'd like to uh, sh- send a little shout-out thanks to Senator Rob Smith, who was with us in the first segment. And coming up in the next segment, Jazz Shaw, the weekend editor at Hot Air. So, back to our business with Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, how are you? Again. I'm well, yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm a hurting puppy. It's, it really is a disaster getting old when stuff starts to break and you don't like it. <laughs> but that's beside the point. Um, you tend to get around quite a bit. What is your feeling when you go to some of the, the citizen-oriented events? What's your feeling about people on the right towards uh, the upcoming primary uh, election and then the general election? What's the angst out there? What's the gestalt, if we, if you would? Um, how do you think people are, are thinking, and what do you think they're going to do about it? Um, when I go out and talk to people, I try to, um, I try not to dive into the primaries or, or candidates. I, I'm, I'm really trying to focus on what issues, um, people are concerned about. And I'll tell you one of the big ones that I'm, I think we're, we're going to keep hearing about is this IRS, the developing IRS story. Um, I think a bipartisan disgust um, you know, dealing with the IRS in a negative light is a scary thing, and and to to see that the fact that it was it's all blatantly obvious now that they were they were targeting people based on their their political thoughts um, is scary, and it should be scary. Um, and I, you know, for those that that lean to the progressive side, I would say, you know. Turnabout is fair play, and you wouldn't like it if it was done the other way around. Um, so, you know, that that's a scary thing that, that people within the IRS, I think that's really gotten to people. Um, you know, one of the other things that, that I keep hearing about is federal spending. Um, that's going to continue to be an issue. Obamacare uh, is... It's going to, I mean, it, and Obamacare is really going to come home to roost um, with local governments um, in the next couple of years, especially if, if next year um, local departments, for instance, teachers, uh, cops, firefighters, are going to be going into to new new contract negotiations because their ta- the, the Cadillac tax takes effect, I believe, in 2017, and and the issue is going to be who picks up the, the tax bill. Now, that's correct. Let me ask the same question, but slightly different, uh, Lee. Um, I mentioned angst, unease. When people, do you think people are continuing to trust their government? How about how about attacking it from that standpoint? Because it gets away from the elections and all that, and, and really goes to the heart of what I was trying to get at. 
it really is, a, a, I think, uh, from my standpoint, I see all this stuff going on at the federal level, a little less so at the state level, except with our elected politicians. But is this government actually serving us, or are we now expected to serve it, shut up, or we're going to bring you into court and bankrupt you? Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit. I think there's definitely a mistrust of government, um, both at the, the, the state level and the federal level. Um, I think the danger f- for us and something that, that we're trying to prevent is apathy. Um, I, what, I, what I would hate to see is people say there's nothing we can do, uh, there's no way to fix the issue, and I'm just going to let it ride. Um, what we're trying to prevent is apathy. Um, and, and the only way to prevent that is to keep educating people keep getting them involved, have them show up, have them call um, uh, Maggie Hassan and, and Jean Sheen. Matter of fact, um, just yesterday on the Strong New Hampshire website, we launched a petition uh, which people can go online at, at strongnh.com and sign it. And it, it's a petition for Governor Hassan and Senator Sheen telling them that we can't afford their higher gas taxes. So, so that's, that's really what we need to do is keep people involved, keep them in the fight, because as, that's, that's really what they want us to do is, is, you know, crawl into our cave, not bother them, and let them run amok. One of, the, um, one of the points that Senator Smith kept coming back to time and time again when we were talking about solving problems with spending or with uh, politicians who don't do what we ask or follow the platform, he kept saying, you got to go out and vote them out of office. you got to vote them out of office. You have a vote. You have to go and vote and be engaged and to, you know, step up and, and pay attention and, and, you know, just go vote. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean and there, there, that is definitely true. I mean, you can't sit home on, on, those, on those election days. But the other thing is, is you can't just, you know, come out on November 4th and and, and retire to your living room and, and not do anything the rest of the time. I mean, this is a, these got the people that want to bankrupt or are bankrupting America. I won't say want, but are through either incompetence or, or just not you know not being fiscally educated are doing it 365 days a year, and that we need to constantly be a vigilant on what they're doing, not only in Concord, but also in Washington, on what they're doing. I mean, I, I think you, I don't know if you guys saw the, the editorial in the union leader yesterday about overpayments. I did not. I, I, I saw mean, it, but I haven't read it. <laughs> the, the, the overpayments, I mean, if you go down the line, to defense, Medicare, Medicaid, there's, I mean, multi-billion dollar overpayments. Great. I mean, this is this is what, you know, a fiscal calamity looks like. And, and he's, you know, yes, voting is one thing. And it definitely is one of those things that we, we, we should all try to do and, and all do. Um, but our responsibility as citizens cannot end there. Our responsibility is to hold them accountable, to, to write them directly, to write letters to the editor, to, to help educate our neighbors about what's really going on um, at, on a personal level, because the media is not doing it. Um, the, you know, the, we're not getting the truth out of Washington. So um, it falls on to, at least this is how we see our role at Strong New Hampshire, is it falls on to groups like us to be able to keep informing citizens and giving them the tools to understand what's going on in Washington and Concord and how it's affecting them. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I think you brought up a great word, apathy. Because for the normal person, and I had a, a discussion on Facebook, which I'm probably going to post as Facebook doodlings at some point over the weekend, um, where somebody who's very active decided to complain, why, why weren't you active before that? It's like, you know, at some point people live their own lives, they're interested in their careers, interested in their families and those kinds of activities. And they don't always pay attention to politics or government because by right, if we were even back in the 1800s, government was such a small amount of our lives, it, you didn't have to pay attention to it. Uh, and we still seem to be on autopilot on that. But I'll tell you, Matt, 
and you probably know this as 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 well. It isn't just the ordinary folks that uh, get apathetic after a while, get that sense of, I don't know what else I can do to change things, just give up and just hunker down and try to live through it. I mean, almost every activist I know, including <clears throat> myself, has had bouts of that where you go, I'm hitting my head against the wall, you know, six, eight hours a day after regular work, and what am I ending up with uh, at the end of that except a bruised forehead? And it's very hard to to stay up and keep working when you see the government just keeps getting bigger and they keep ignoring you more, and now they're getting to the point where they want to put your th- put their thumb on you harder. Oh, and yeah. Longer. I mean, I mean uh, um, you know, you're really preaching to the choir because, I mean, as you know, I mean, I've been doing this now for, geez, six, what? seven, eight years. Yep. <laughs> And there's there's days that I'm just like you know we we seem to be going backwards, but you know we gotta we gotta we gotta enjoy the first downs as much as we do the touchdowns. Um, and when I say first downs, I mean as long as we're we gotta move that ball forward. And, and listen, the, the defeating 1589 was a first down. We gotta celebrate that. We we have to. I mean, skip years ago. You remember the tax cap? Oh yeah. I mean, we got that. We got that through the Supreme Court. We got that. You know, we got the legislature to change that, not only and allow it in the cities, but also allow towns to do it. So that you know, that's a victory. I mean, these people, the the, the progressive end of this political spectrum, has accepted and worked for incrementalism in their favor. We have to be willing to accept and work for incrementalism in our favor. And the way we have to do that is is to, by taking the vi- small victories that we can, um, you know, working to to defeat a gas tax, working to to letting you know we, we the the special session with Medicaid expansion was a victory. Um, it was a short lived one, but it was a victory. And you know we have to build off those things. And, and that's one of the things that I think is going to come back and, and, and really change the dynamic next session. Um, and, and remember, if that waiver doesn't come through in 2015, um, we have a chance to get out of Medicaid expansion. So we always we have to remember to be vigilant um, because as, as soon as we're not vigilant is when they'll just, you know, do the end run and run it to the the end zone. Um, So we have to be willing to accept the first downs uh, and the small victories. I mean, mean, look at the governor was about to take a trip to Turkey um, in June, and and it was going to be, you know, a big win for her. And and what we were able to do was cast doubt over it by the fact that in the middle of the fact, well, she was had a travel ban for everybody else, she used fifteen thousand dollars in general fund spending, and she went to Turkey with her with some business leaders and staff. So, so uh, we're running to the end of the segment. Yeah, that's important. I think that the double standard exists, and we need to just keep talking about that. Uh, as we get to the end of this segment, how do people reach out to Strong NH? They can go to our website, citizensforstrongnewhampshire.com. dot com. Uh, and the, just sign up right there. What we're going to be doing over the next couple months is we're, we're doing phone banks in our office to educate people on on the, uh, the issues like Medicaid expansion, the gas tax, um, Second Amendment protections. Uh, so if people want to volunteer, they can just volunteer right on the website, and uh, somebody will contact you, and we'll let you know what we're doing over the next a couple months to, to, to educate voters. All right, Matt Murphy from Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us here at Grot Talk. Thank All you, right, Matt. thanks for having me. All right, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Okay, that's uh, the end of our Matt Murphy segment. And uh, coming up next, Jazz Shaw from uh, Hot Air. He's the weekend editor there. We'll be back with him in just a few minutes. I'm Steve McDonald with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers, and this is Grot Talk.
This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning. You're listening to Grok Talk. Oh, feel the power. Oh, I can feel it. Our moment of triumph approaches. <laughs> it's Grok Talk. This episode of Grok Talk was originally recorded on July 12th, 2014. All the original ads and content remain intact, but it has been edited to fit our new programming format. Excellent. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative, but State Senator Dave Booten has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. He voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%. Taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Putin's vote? Call Senator Putin at 603-203-5391 and tell him that we're on to his wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Are you from New Hampshire? Have you ever been to New Hampshire? Has anyone you've known ever sent you a postcard from New Hampshire? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you too can become one of New Hampshire's very own Little Wandering Voters. Thanks to the Senator Martha Fuller Clark's Home for the Little Wandering Voters Foundation. With your out-of-state voter participation and your liberal contribution, we can help Senator Martha and all her liberal pals stay in office. He tried to make us believe he was a fiscal conservative. But State Senator Jeb Bradley has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, he claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in. But all along, voting like a liberal Democrat. And oh, how he drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now, Senator Bradley is leading the charge to try and pass a Senate bill to prevent us from criticizing his vote. Call Senator Bradley at 603-569-4208 and tell him that we're on to his wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell him to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Hi, this is Rich Gerard, host of Gerard at Large in the Morning, the Manchester area's only locally owned, locally operated, focused and interested, riveting radio show heard live every Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 on 90.7 FM WLMW, New Hampshire Family Radio, and available 24-7 live or archived at GerardAtLarge.com. Be sure to tune in. This is the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org. She tried to make us believe she was a fiscal conservative. But State Senator Nancy Stiles has been deceiving New Hampshire taxpayers. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, she claimed to be one of us, pretending to blend in, but all along voting like a liberal Democrat. She voted to raise your gas tax by another 23%, taking a bigger bite out of our wallets every time we're at the pump. 
And oh, how she drooled at the opportunity to vote to expand Obamacare, which will result in higher taxes and longer wait times in the emergency room. And now the Senate wants to pass a bill to prevent us from criticizing Senator Stiles' vote. Call Senator Stiles at 603-918-0553 and tell her that we're on to her wolf and sheep's clothing routine. Tell her to stop pretending to be a fiscal conservative and start voting like one. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Talk. Welcome back to Grok Talk. Brought to you by the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers at cnhg.org and granitegrok.com. I am Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers to talk to you about news, information, culture, and politics. And our next guest is Jazz Shaw, which means we're also here to talk about how we got locked out again. Jazz, welcome to the program. (laughs) You there? I think I... Hello? Jazz, you there? Yeah, now I am. Oh, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> I'm pushing the wrong buttons. Hey, welcome to the program. I've been trying to get you on here for weeks. Hey, glad to be on. It's uh, it's nice to be there virtually, although I prefer to be there personally. I've been really enjoying my recent trips to New Hampshire, and I'll probably be up there again in September. You guys have uh, probably the most fun politics in the nation. So Don't, you junk- Don't you think? Don't you think? For junkies, it's a great place to go. Yeah, yeah and we, ha- we have a great primary going on uh you know, the Democrats don't have primaries because they're all so far left, nobody can get between them and the left wall already. <laughs> yeah, I, I was up there uh, earlier this year, uh, interviewed a few of your your primary candidates for the Republican Party, and uh, and that was fun. I saw you had one uh, drop out a little while ago who I, I did an interview with, and uh, that, that was kind of sad. I, I like Karen Testament. I don't know what you guys thought about her. I, I, I don't think she ever, you know, really got the wind at her sails to do any fundraising or really become a presence, but I thought she was very sincere and a nice lady. Oh, she is. I've known her for years. In fact, a, lo- a lot of us all travel in the same circles up here. So she's been a, a conservative activist forever. It, it just didn't turn out to be uh, what people wanted for her to do here, but uh, I don't think there's many topics or issues that we would disagree with her uh, as far n- as us here at Granite Rock. None, none I think. She's... Uh She's absolutely sincere, committed, a huge <clears throat> activist, and very energetic. And she's, uh, you know, when she was running, she came over to meet a crowd at my house, and every answer was from the heart. There's, there's no doubt about that. But she's never been able to get the broad base of support she needed to actually win statewide office. And, you know, I feel feel real bad for her, but that is, in fact, the case. So as a nationally, uh, more or less national pundit on the topics, what do you see from wherever you are about our current senatorial crop now that Karen stepped out? I, 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 two months ago, I would have had a very different answer. I, I would have assumed that once she stepped out, I, at one point I saw something, she was polling up near 10%, you know, which is not, uh, not shabby at all and not an insignificant number of people. And I would have thought that if she wasn't going to finish the race, that most of her supporters would probably gravitate over to Senator Smith, uh, who I also interviewed. Uh, thought, you know, he's got a lot of juice left in him, I, I think, personally. Uh, but the national opinion, of course, if you go and just talk with the uh, the chattering heads in New York City and down in the Beltway and all the money people, and I suppose Boston as well, everybody's just, you know, got this sugar high about uh, about Scott Brown I didn't think that was going to happen. Uh, when, when I was up there for the uh, Northeast Republican Leadership Conference, I talked to a few of your state leaders in the uh, in the legislature, and I, I got almost universal responses of, you know, I'd talk to them and be like, hey, Scott Brown, huh? And they were like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. So I, I, uh, I didn't think he'd be doing as well as he's doing. Uh, he, At this point, I, I think the consensus is starting to you know, drift that there was just too much money and too much outside power and name recognition in there, and he might drift across the line. And then comes the question, is anybody going to beat Gene? You know, uh, I I thought the chances looked a lot better earlier this year. Right now, it's going to be a nail-biter, I think. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, if you're watching the live stream, uh, Mike at the end of the table, had Scott Brown into his house to meet a whole lot of people. And it started there that you could ask him a question, but he'd always deflect away from the question. It was always about his personal narrative about him. 
And we found it very difficult to get straight answers out of him. And so far, that's chased him around the state, where a lot of the activists who are really going to go out and vote for him are turning away from him because he won't give a straight answer. He says that, well, I'm the anti-Shaheen, and the latest polls came out that Bob Smith is just even with him or a, a touch better than what he's doing against Shaheen. And I just find it very amusing that the establishment wing of the party, including what we call the five families here, all the, the head honchos like Kelly Ayotte, Governor Sununu, and f- folks of that ilk, uh, they're all in for him. And the, the grassroots are actually going, go away. We don't like you. And the latest polling shows the unfavorable rating. He's totally upside down. Yeah, I mean, it, well, not just the latest. Since he got in the race, as long as WMUR and UNH, which are not exactly top conservative polling outfits, as long as they have been tracking Scott Brown, his unfavorables have exceeded his favorables by an average 10%. Uh, and even though the gap is closing slightly, his unfavorables continue to rise. And, and you know, you can't win an election like that. And I, I, the, my big fear is that they'll tick off just enough people that uh, he won't get the turnout. Well, that, that's very possible, but I, going back to what you said a minute before, his uh, unique ability, well, not unique at all, to deflect a question and not answer it, I think that uh, would show, you know, uh, down in the beltway at least, unique qualifications for <laughs> being in Washington, D.C., because that seems to be what you get of most senators, so clearly he has some experience in that. Send me, yeah. send me to D.C. I'm as slimy as they are. Go skip. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've, you've probably heard the joke of the two old-timers saying, well, what do you think of so-and-so? And the other guy says, well, I don't know. I've only met him three times so far. That really, that retail politics really does hold here in New Hampshire. And what I'm hearing is that the more pe- times, unless you're absolutely in thrall with him already, the more that the conservative activists see him, the less they like him. But they go to see, can we find a redeeming quality in him? And they're not. And, and that's a problem. And that's exactly why I had the House gathering was because I thought there was a strong chance he would get the nomination. Can we can we get behind this guy in a pinch? And the unfortunate answer is hell no. Well, you, you mentioned the establishment figures in and, let's just be honest, largely outside of the state. Uh, why would they have a vested interest in that? Well, it's the name recognition. It's the cocktail party circuit in New York and, and in D.C. Running a Senate campaign is expensive, as we all know. Uh, primaries are getting expensive, but the general election campaign is, is quite expensive. A little bit, I've, I've managed a couple campaigns myself, a little cheaper in New Hampshire than if you're fighting somewhere like in Florida or, or New York or something like that. But it's still expensive, and I think there was a... I don't want to use the word fear, but a concern, you know, of, well, who can attract the kind of money it's going to take to, to mount a challenge to an incumbent. And that might have also played a little bit in his favor for those who uh, generally proclaim to know better than the unwashed masses, the rest of us, you know. <laughs> well, thinking of knowing better than the unwashed washed masses, problem numero uno with Mr. Brown is he claims to read the bills and he claims to know better than us unwashed masses when he should go along with the Democrats, which is most of the time. Uh, Steve, you telling me I'm getting low on time? No, 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 not at all. Uh, The other thing is for a guy who reads the bills and is a lawyer, he's got astoundingly bad judgment of people and situations as witness his involvement in a shell corporation. Yeah, there's there's been enough stories about him if uh, the media ever took the interest to really go after them and bring them to the front page. But, you know, I, I, I'm i not a creature of New Hampshire. I'm just so used to it between D.C. and New York City that uh, that's just not a surprise anymore. You tried to get the New York Times to report on something, the latest Lois Lerner story, for example, that came out uh, when they finally covered it uh, seven days after everyone else had hit it. It was on page A16. It was beaten out on that page by a new cooking show. So you, you, have, you have to be able to, you know, get some sort of 
earn media to go along with you. Well, and if you're you. if you're not in the right uh, side of the think tank, or I should say the left side of the think tank, uh, that can be exceedingly difficult. And was that Janet, Janet Yellen's uh, show on cooking the books? Um, <laughs> no, no, seriously. Well, I, what I want to know, and I can't find the root of it, is what he did in Massachusetts to tick off the Boston Globe, which is an offshoot of the progressive New York Times media, uh, so badly that they are going for his jugular time after time. The Boston Globe? The, bo- uh, the, bo- the Boston Globe did the research that broke the story on the Shell Corporation that he had signed on to and got the $1.3 million worth of stock. But you're, you're, you're talking about Massachusetts. Uh, do they love Scott Brown? Uh, I would say you have to give that a qualified answer. If you have to pick a Republican they're going to like, well, Scott Brown's your guy. Uh, they're going to like him a lot more than someone who's more seriously conservative. But then if you offer them a choice between he or any other member of the GOP, any, any other uh, person with notably conservative leanings, and then offer them a Democrat, uh, you're going to go after the Republican. Yeah. All right, uh, Jez, we're going to take a quick 60-second break, and we'll be right back to talk about something else like immigration or something. I mean, hang on a second. We'll be right back. Wait, no, we won't be right back. Wait, now we'll be back. I am Steve McDonald here with Skip Murphy and Mike Rogers, and we are Grok Talk, talking to Jazz Shaw, the weekend editor at Hot Air. Jazz, uh, let's move on to immigration, which I think will probably play a, uh, could play a strong hand in the uh, next presidential election, but it may also play a hand in the November elections. What do you think? Uh, I, I want to get to that in one second, not, oh, okay. to de- not to derail your own show, but <laughs> for everybody who was just listening to that last ad that uh, Steve Booten had, um, I don't know who developed that, who sent that to you, but I do have a question. I was listening to the voiceover guy on that. Mm -hmm. Now, I hear a lot of ads in the New York and Pennsylvania market in Washington. I just came back from a trip to uh, Tennessee uh, where there have been a lot of ads uh, running about the United Auto Workers story that I've been covering down there. Mm -hmm. And I swear it's the same guy that does the voiceover. (laughs) are there just is there an army of guys in this country with the exact same voice, or is this one guy they've got chained in a basement somewhere in a media center, and he gets like three pieces of bread and a glass of water a day, and just, and just they give him scripts and he just runs ads? It's I swear, guys, it's the same dude. Well, it was, if you remember for like movie trailers, it was the same guy for years and years and years until he died recently, and so I think maybe this and, and this guy isn't eating bread. He's probably got gold plates because he's probably making a lot of money doing voiceover work but uh yeah probably is the same guy and he probably just sits in a studio all day and reads these things uh, and well, unfo- unfortunately steve does our voiceovers but we haven't got the gold plates to give him yet Mm-mm. okay well you know you got to keep at that because you eventually if you if you don't get the bread you'll get the plates so. <laughs> Any, anyway to, to the immigration question i uh, this uh god where do you even start good i question, mean we, we've question. got the president down there uh, briefly showing up and then going and making fun of the people who are criticizing him or even threatening to take him to court, et, et cetera. Uh, he, he's down there talking about the horrors of a situation which he has almost, single. I say almost, and it is almost single-handedly created himself. Yeah, it, it dates back further, but the, the situation certainly been exacerbated considerably over the last six years. Uh, by the policies that we've had in place, not only official policies, but much more to the point, unofficial policies. What you say behind your hand when you're talking about, well, you know, we need to have a way for the undocumented, we don't want to say illegal aliens, because apparently you're a racist or a homophobe or something if you say that. That would be but, us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we've had people going out on TV and saying, oh, dear, we have to find a way to let them stay here. We, we have guys who are actual illegal aliens, uh, one, I forget his last name, begins with a V, out there doing specials for CNN, having documentaries put on the air, people sitting there interviewing him, and and he's talking about all these subjects while proudly proclaiming, well, I'm an undocumented, you know, uh, resident or whatever. And I find myself looking at, looking at that, I watch one of those shows, and I'm asking myself, you know, I realize ICE is overburdened, uh, and, you know, they don't have enough people to, to round up 12 million illegal aliens. I sympathize with that. But surely they could find this guy. I mean, he's on TV. <laughs> you know, how tough could it be to track him down? Uh, how about the same effort as it did to find that guy in Benghazi who's been doing uh, interviews for two and a half years? 
Well, exactly. well, well, let's, sitting yeah. at the hotel drinking his mango juice. But just just to finish, um, that that doesn't stay inside of our borders. We have international media. The word gets around, and particularly if you're you know somebody who's interested in smuggling drugs or weapons or anything like that, somebody who might let's just say benefit from seeing a overwhelming flood of people showing up at our border and overwhelming our resources. You know, they, they go out and spread those rumors. Hey, look at this clip we've got. They're talking about how great it's going to be, and you go, and nobody's going to send you back. And even if that's not true, you live in another country that has maybe, you know, three radio stations and one TV station two hours a day. You're going to hear that and be like, oh, we should send the kids. That sounds pretty good. You know, <laughs> so I, I, we've created this crisis. And I just I don't see any way to deny that and to pretend that it wasn't a fairly recent creation for the magnitude that we're dealing with is silly. And there is nobody uh, in the administration or their supporters who is willing to talk even for a moment about doing something concrete to actually stop the flow as well as quickly and efficiently and humanely getting all the intruders out and back where they came from unless you're willing to put something on the table in terms of, here comes the word, comprehensive immigration reform. And if you're not willing to talk about that, plus amnesty, plus this, then you don't get to talk about doing something to solve the actual problem. So politics has once again paralyzed us, and nothing's getting done. Well, we need to get to single-purpose bills. So you say, close the border. If you don't sign this bill, the rest of it's dead. Uh, the same kind of way Harry Reid treats anything that comes out of the House. But that, that wasn't the point I really wanted to make. Um, it was widely trumpeted earlier in the week that Guatemala and Honduras were running ads uh, discouraging the shipping of children. But that's, uh, that's the public face. Uh, under the table, I believe there are equally, uh, if not more, reports that the governments are encouraging parents to ship their children. But what I really want to understand, and nobody's got an article on it, there has to be collusion between the Obama administration and the Mexican government to give these kids passage across Mexico because Mexico can't stand illegal immigrants and will deport them back to their point of origin toot sweet. So why the heck are they able to traverse hundreds of miles of Mexico to end up at our border? I have an alternate theory from yours, sorry. Um, I, I think it would be extreme, not extremely, but it would be far more difficult for there to be some sort of American collusion for trailside activities, shall we say, going north-south across the length of Mexico than it would be for the actual powers that be in Mexico. And this is just opinion. Feel free to hang me out to dry. Mexico has not been run by the Mexican government in ages. Mexico is run by the cartels. There's a few places inside the cities. Uh, it's, it's kind of like Afghanistan in that fashion. And uh, I think there is a tremendous benefit, as I alluded to earlier, to you know, swamping the American border and creating this sort of havoc. I think this if you have nefarious things in mind, that presents all sorts of opportunities. And if you are someone or some number of persons who are involved in various cartels controlling different bits of territory, then having a whole stream of kids and families heading for the border presents you with two opportunities. Number one, if you're involved in the uh, pedophile child sex trade and drug mules, you know, picking off the odd kids, that gives you a much richer supply. And the ones that you don't pick off or don't care to, uh, helping them make it to the border probably doesn't cost very much, and there's a plus for you in that. Yeah, there was a report uh, that I saw first thing this morning about some of these illegal children signing up for school in a northern border uh, Massachusetts town, and they're kind of wondering whether or not these folks are really, uh, you know, illegal alien children because their hair's gray. <laughs> I, I kid you. That. I kid you not. I got to go back uh, and find it and post it. But here's the here's the two words I want you to consider. Actually, four words: dense pack, cloward piven. Is this just another facet of what we've seen? I haven't been doing politics all that long, but I remember when I first opened up Granite Rock in 2006, it was easy to keep on top of the one or two very important issues. Now I almost almost paralyze at the end of the day when I get home from work and I put get ready to put fingers to keyboard. It's like, which one do I talk about first? There's so many of them, it's almost paralyzing. Are we really being cloward pivoted here? Everywhere, you know, any, every, any issue, any direction, any facet of life in America. I, I'm not going to say that's an unfair comparison, but 
I've been doing this a little longer since the 90s, uh, and, you know, I, I watch the cycles come and go, and the news cycle is a self-feeding beast. It will never mm -hmm. remain empty because much like nature, it abhors a vacuum. But there are times when things are relatively better, let's say, domestically and, and worse abroad or, or vice versa. Or there are one story or a couple of stories that are huge and they draw everyone's attention and everything else seems to get tamped down. You mentioned 2006, the whole period from... 2004 to 2006, 2007, was dominated by the Iraq War and, to a lesser extent, the, the war in Afghanistan. It engaged domestic debate. Foreign policy was up front. That's what everybody was talking about. There were other things going on during that time, but they didn't get as much attention. Uh, if you wind down the wars, even though, of course, the first one that we wound down has now turned around and exploded in our faces like a bad Fourth of July fireworks, and the other one's not looking too good, at the same time, we just have this, this plethora of domestic stories. And you, you might think, wow, uh, the Obama administration has really done something wrong here, and everybody should be talking about that. And maybe your here is lowest learner in the IRS. Maybe it's uh, the NSA. You know, th there's any number. But no matter which one you're pointing at, there's a bunch more. And then you have a media required to cover them all, a large portion of which spent an entire month being preoccupied with a plane that went down and talked about virtually nothing else. So, yeah, you, you, you can become paralyzed trying to find things to talk about, but at the same time, I think this also gives non-mainstream media outlets, uh, the less heard voices, more of an avenue, more of an opportunity, simply because there are so many things happening that are not getting the kind of coverage that a lot of the... Uh, political consuming audience would like to see them get. So, uh, you know, it, as I said, it's an opportunity. So as I just wanted to ask, as a blogger, um, we often get, you know, we do this on our own time, so we pick and choose the stories that interest us at the time or that appear to have the energy necessary for us to make, make, make them get out there and have people pick them up. Uh, your, your stage is a little bit bigger. Um, do you find people reaching out to you and saying, hey, how come you're not covering this? Hey, how come you're not covering that? Do I find that? Oh, once or twice out of every four comments on the site, out of every nine emails I get out of a hundred every day, no matter what you talk about, there will be, you know, everything from, you know, I really wish you would talk more about this or there isn't a story or why are you covering this up? You're clearly part of Nancy Pelosi's conspiracy, you know. It's like, but you, as you said, you have to to find the stories that interest you when there's a lot of people already talking about those other things. Uh, I'll give you an example. This morning, I'm just looking at the lineup of things that, that I've already got published just today and stuff I have come up later. I have a piece on the Export-Import Bank, which I think is a hugely important story. Mm -hmm. But it's so far down the shelf that there's nobody on CNN, MSNBC, even Fox. You, you get a brief couple-second spot here or there. And it, and it doesn't get talked about, and, and it is a huge story that involves a lot of taxpayer money. Uh, the second one I hit was uh, more, uh, you know, nasty, uh, illicit doings with the solar panel industry, where there are big problems. But again, if you're interested in hearing about, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, if you want the real bloody rag waving, uh, then that's just not interesting enough. And... You know, so where do you go from there? Well, you go and you do what works for you. You do what you think is important, and if people are that upset about it, well, they can go find what they're looking for somewhere else. There's enough of us now that there is somebody talking about it. Yeah, and, and we do get the thank you. We do. We get the what Steve talked about was the uh, how come you're not covering this? I get that quite a lot in emails. But we find that we're at a lot of the political events because we tend to be more politically oriented here and covering events that there's nobody from the mainstream press there at all we do the live streaming from there we'll do the interviews because we're, we're all a bunch of techies as well so we take this whole technical stuff on the road and and do that kind of stuff but we we do get that thank you and i do see a tremendous role and hot air is one that i hit several times a day uh to hear about the stories that the mainstream press doesn't even want to bring up. And I think it's more of a case, it's not a case that they don't, they don't have the time to do it. 
they don't want to do it for whatever ideological reason. And remember, as Glenn Reynolds, Insta Pundit, says, they're all Democrats with bylines anyways. <laughs> There's an element of both, I'm going to say. Uh, there was a time when I got into a rather, I won't say heated, but an extended debate with Jake Tapper. Uh, when the plane story was going on, I was sitting there writing like uh, an article every other day about Leland Yee, and I'm sure you guys know who Leland Yee is. Mm-hmm. We wrote about him. But the vast majority of the country still to this day has no idea who Leela Yee was because it, it, that was a case where I, uh, the, the point I was trying to make was that in CNN's case, Jake did, like, hit it on Twitter and on his own, the lead blog uh, on CNN's website. But they have their programming schedule, and there were X number of stories they could fit in on top of the plane, the plane, because that's all they could talk about was the plane for a month. And Leland Yee was so far down. But at the same time, there's no question in my mind that a lot of the powers that be at CNN, and I brought that up to him directly, though he uh, doesn't personally own up to it, that they don't want to talk about a Democrat who gets in trouble nearly as, it's not nearly as much fun as a Republican who gets in trouble. And for sure, you do not want to utter the name of a Democrat who was a big anti-gun proponent smuggling weapons into the country, including rocket launchers. You know, that's that's a bad, bad story for Democrats, so they don't like it. So you know, oh, that must have been Leyland over in California. That was Leyland Yee, yes. <laughs> All right, well, Jazz, we're running to the end of this segment. Um, how would people reach out to you in the blog? How would they reach out Email? Do you have a, if you wanted people to contact you for any reason, ask you why you're not writing about something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, it's no secret. I don't even use my, my hot air email. People can. I have one uh, main uh, Gmail address, which is just jazzshotgmail.com, and people are free to, you know, go ahead and lambast me or suggest stories, or if you're nice, you can even say, hey, nice, kind of nice job, you idiot, you know, or, or send <laughs> tips, uh, you know, for, for things that you think we should be covering. If it's interesting, I'll do that. But mostly, uh, if you already have a comment account at Hot Air, obviously, just get in and jump in the comments. We read them. And if you don't, you know, let me know occasionally. We can, you know, scrounge up a couple extra comment accounts. All right. Well, I want to thank you for taking some time to be on the program with us. We're going to try to get you back at some point in the future. And you said you'll probably be here in September, maybe? Yeah, I'll be up there. I'll uh, let you guys, I'll drop you a note before I get there. Maybe we can stop by and uh, do a cold one. All okay. right. Well, Thanks, if, you, if you come up the Saturday before the Tuesday, we're we'll have go. you on the show. I'm going to cut Mike off because we're running out of time. Have a great weekend. We'll see you. Welcome back to Grok Talk. Welcome back to Grok Talk, where there is babbling and. Now we. Uh, that looks good on the eye of Sauron. <laughs> the eye of Sauron. Now I'm going to turn Mike's mic back on. Uh, this is Grok Talk, brought to you by GranitGrok.com and the Coalition of New Hampshire. Tech Bears. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on YouTube. We are on Ustream. We are on Blip TV. I'm told, even though I've yes. never seen it, we are on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spreaker, AC Nation Radio. There are no excuses for why you don't know what we're talking about unless you just don't care. True. Because so, St- Steve has done a masterful job of getting us on just about every available outlet and promoting it. Well and, done, Steve. And while I do not almost ever suffer from the overwhelming of issues and the cloud piven theory thing and all that stuff about what to write about and so on and so forth, making all of this work, that is exhausting. So It is. Please feel free to donate to Granite Rock, and we will put that to use to help make it easier on us to bring you people like Jazz Shaw and Senator Smith and all the other great folks that we've had on the program. Yes, and just to make sure, once again, none of it goes into our pockets. We all have regular jobs that we do every single day. Anything that comes in helps support the server so we can keep you up, keep it up and running or goes into better production quality equipment for us. Cables, <laughs> cables go bad, things break, stuff wears out, and we have to replace it. And the rest of us put our money into showing up at events and making sure that we can bring you the best news uh, possible from around New Hampshire. Donate. <laughs> Donate now. We don't take money out. Steve's being subliminal here. Uh, yes. <laughs> Donate. I'm going to get a I'm going to instead of having stuff like this which I didn't even have on. Hold on. Instead of having stuff like this, yeah, baby, I'm going to have stuff like donate. 
<laughs> Whispered on. Uh, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna get Homer Simpson, who says donuts, and I'm gonna change it to donate. <laughs> And yes, we're going to have a little fuzz because I have to start charging my battery. Anyway, so yes, um, Kimberly was going to join us today. I hope she's listening. She uh, she overslept and didn't have time to take a shower and get here. It takes her an hour. So we, we our special guest host was unable to join us. Uh, and so we'll get her on a different week. Well, and, um, why don't you mention the phone number just in case she's inclined to dial six, in? Six Kimberly, if you'd like to call us and be a part of the program, you can dial six zero three seven. Are you getting a pencil? I'll wait. Okay. You ready? 603-715-9689. You can call in and be a part. I don't know which line that is. I forget. I think it's line one. But uh, we'll find out when you call it. Okay? Make make Ed Larkin flash. You can do it. Anyway, while we wait for that or anybody else who wants to call and, and bump Kimberly. <laughs> Punishment for being late. Um, what a week. So much what a going week, on. What a week. We had hey, hey, uh, hey. a lot of things. and oh, Just pick a topic and we'll go from there. <laughs> Governor's race? Governor's race. It uh, Once again, it was nice to be able to hand out one of our two endorsements last Saturday at the CNHT uh, picnic. That it went to Andrew Hemingway running for New Hampshire uh, governor here in the Granite State. Because he's earned it the hard way. He's been here from the beginning. He's been with the Tea Parties from the first day, practically. He's run pl- organizations like uh, um, Republican Liberty Caucus in New Hampshire. And he didn't uh, call us teabaggers. He ran uh, the branch of 4RG, for a Republican governor in New Hampshire. He ran the uh, Gingrich campaign. Not quite as conservative as he is, but still very good practice. And he's run two successful businesses. The guy typifies... Up and coming New Hampshire, and uh, and he's a true conservative. Yeah, and I think Steve, you've got it right, because that really is the big controversy that is really enveloping the conservative activists based here in New Hampshire. The word got out, and again, it was us, the alternative media, that covered the event. Uh, that uh, Mike, you found the video. Yeah. Put it up, the longer version to show more of a context, and while. You know, and then the story started from last Saturday. By the way, we're still the only ones who have the video up because MUR dropped it, and then the link to NH Journal went with it. And when I checked it yesterday, now they may have fixed it. When I checked it yesterday, they hadn't updated it, so they still don't have the 17 seconds or whatever it was the original clip was. Uh, We have that clip. We have the full version, and we have it in several places, so you can't possibly miss it. It's still there. Yes, so if it goes dead on on one way, we can resurrect it on another. And, and, And since we have downloaded the legal, publicly available copy from iTunes University... Uh, we can actually put it on our server if for any reason iTunes University is pressured to make it go dark. But th- th- the bottom line is there, there, are, there are two segments. Uh, I mean, it was basically a fairly uh, typical, boring CEO addresses students speech that went on for an hour and 11 minutes. But in the beginning where he introduced himself, Walt Havenstein bragged about his and his family's deep roots in Maryland, deep roots with the University of Maryland, and so on and so forth. And then near the end, he said, so why would a guy who's about 60 who was thinking of retiring into politics in New Hampshire come down here to Maryland to run SIAC? S-A-I-C. He says, stand up, guys. I want to see who you are. Stand up again. That's why. You know, in, at, at BAE, I was running an exceptional company. Here, I'm running a company of exceptional people. And, you know, and my take on that is how does that make the people at BAE feel? Uh, he clearly is basically is saying that the people that at SAIC were a cut above anything else he'd ever worked with, and that's what, what he was excited about. And then he got into the politics uh, near the end of his speech, and he said, you know, last thing should have been the first thing. Did you guys go out and vote yesterday? So he knew it was an important election. Uh, talked about the ability of America to change up its government every two years. Uh, unlike the Brits who are stuck with their queen for 50 years. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. must have gone over well with you. 
Well, that's a whole different discussion ab- about the progressives that would like to do away with the monarchy and but any other checks. Apparently, and as, a, as the CEO of BAE, he wasn't very happy with the crown for some reason. I, uh, I, I, I can't imagine because the queen does next to nothing in politics. They mm. are the last and final veto exercised about once every 30 years for really, really bad legislation. Uh, otherwise, they're there to attract tourists. And the chances are that the royal family extracts more money from Americans than anything else else in Britain, uh, precisely because they're a tourist attraction. Anyway, on to, on to the rest of it. So he goes through all of this, and he talks about how important it, it was. Makes You're obviously aware that he knows it's a wave election. It was, it was a big deal. And then he says, you know, there's a lot of problems in this country, or at least that's what those teabaggers keep telling us or have been telling us all summer. And, and he makes it clear that he thinks he's made a wisecrack. Now, there's two ways to look at this. Either he made a wisecrack and he didn't really know that teabaggers was a slur, only that it was some kind of slang, in which case he had to simply fess up and say, look, I didn't know how bad it was. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Take my deepest apology for this. It would have been over. But instead, he wants to dig in and retrench and and basically say, you can't demand an apology. You're not entitled to it. Uh, Well, excuse me. Uh, and, and Skip, you witnessed a finger poking contest with a fellow Marine up there, where uh, thank God it was only fingers in each other's chests, right? Yeah, that happened near the end of that meeting. I did not do not have video of that, um, but it was. I do have another instance of someone uh, standing toe to toe with Walt Havenstein that really wanted an apology as well. De- yeah. Oh yeah, um, Dennis Hamill at. Um, at the CNC picnic, right? He's well, that was guy. one. That this was is one. another guy. This I, is have, a new one. I, have, I know. I haven't put up the video. I was just, just prefacing yet. for people who I weren't guess. aware. Plus, you had asked for an apology on video, and you didn't get it. You yep. refused. And then we have this, which happened after. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And this is, uh, and several other people have asked him to apologize. And as you said, Mike, he's dug in his heels, and he's not going to do this. Now, I'm going to say this publicly now. I've already made it clear that if Scott Brown wins the nomination, regardless of what NHGOP Chair Jennifer Horn is excoriating us to do, I'm not voting for Brown because anybody who can vote with the Democrats 62% of the time his last year in the Senate, I'm sorry, he's not worthy of my vote. I am not a Gene Chandler Republican that I'm going to vote for anybody with an R next to the name just so that we can retain power. And especially, and especially merely, not vote for a Democrat with an R next to their name, like Scott Brown. Yeah. Winning is merely the the preliminary. It's what you do with that power afterwards. And Scott Brown has shown us he didn't use it in a way that complements Republican principles. In this case, it does go to character. Because you're right, Mike. He could have said, all right, I didn't know. I'm sorry. And this would have been a nothing burger. But now he's dug in his heels. And I'll tell you, I, I'm not too sure that he didn't know. No, uh, he has not convinced me that he didn't know what that I meant. I think this proves that he did because people have said, well, I don't think he knew what it meant. I said, well, then why doesn't he just apologize? Yeah. If I say something, if I use a word out of context or I, I, I try to play with a slur to make fun of the hypocritical left and I get the wrong thing, I'm sorry. I guess I, I screwed it up. I'm going to fix it. Yeah, I made a mistake. And we do that at Granite Crack. If we mess up, we apologize. But I will tell you right now, if he is the nominee, because I value my vote, I'm not just going to go along with the herd just p- to play pure politics. My vote is special to me. I'm only going to give it to those people that I believe deserve it. I will not vote in the general election if Walt Havenstein is the nominee, because with this, he has shown a huge character flaw, and I'm not going along with it. And it's a shame. It was, there was an easy way out. Wouldn't have lost any face. Uh, just to say I was trying to be a wise ass and, uh, and sorry I didn't know the full meaning. It's a bit like uh, an American calling a Brit a W anchor. Um, you know, in America that's... A what? W wanker. anchor. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in You've Ameri- never seen in a shirt with a big W and an anchor. Ma- um, no, in, I haven't. In, in America, that's considered to be a fairly, so a fairly light, a fairly light insult. In Britain, it's considered to be fairly serious. And Susan knows that, as she used it the other day. I think. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, was- and, and so the point is. Uh, you know, he could have just thought teabagger was some other way of referring to the Tea Party, or he could have known it was a serious insult. The smirk suggests the latter, but he could have easily got out of it by saying it was the former. 
and saying he didn't mean to offend anybody. Yeah, and he does want to do away completely with the whole nonsense, uh, in his view, of what body language was playing a role in that uh, that speech at the end. So we got the we got the smirk, guys. I mean, I you know. hey, hey, my body language counts, so so does his. Yeah, yeah. You know, anything that we say, and trust me, the Democrats are watching us all the time. And there has been times when uh, Mr. Silver Spoon from the Jersey Shore has picked up on stuff. Yeah. Um, and we finally beat him to death because we refused to give in. In fact, we we kind of grinned and said. Hey, this could be fun. Yeah, free blogging material. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. You notice Put your hands up because we're going to start hitting you. <laughs> and you. And you notice he <laughs> hasn't come back. No, he hasn't. Oh, well, this is, uh, I guess we have to go after uh, uh, Lady Shaheen a bit more. Yeah. This yeah. is Harold Curtin's, right? <laughs> Harold, Harold Pajama Boy Kirstein, Jersey yeah. Shore. Yeah, yeah, Kirstein, yeah. Kirstein, yeah. Kirstein. I don't know. It's Havenstein, not Havenstein. It's yeah, I, I, Kirstein, I, I will whatever. apologize for getting the name, name wrong. Please and, feel free to... Um, I take it Senator Smith didn't stop by because he just came back. Oh. Well, um, hopefully we'll get keys. Maybe that'll be the good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, another, we're going to take topic. we're going to take sixty seconds, and then we're going to have topic. another topic. So we will be right back after this. Steve McDonald here, and we're back. Two Grocksters assemble, and uh, still working on that key thing. <laughs> I like that whole thing, Grokster's Assemble. That's a good name for the segment. Yes. I don't know who came up with it first. I stole it. I know I own it because I've used it so many times it belongs to me. That's how it works. <laughs> I, I learned that from somebody. And that should be a rallying cry when you need a lot of coverage at a meeting, too. Grokster's well, Assemble. We, event we, here. Yes. There you go. So it's, uh, like, it's like calling for the X-Men. Well, let's get away from <laughs> Walt Havenstein and the uh, governor's race. We talked about the senator's race uh, Ad nauseum at various times throughout the show. Yep. Um, let's see what else we have to talk about. I'm sure there's plenty of things. Did I you know it? we said there were plenty of things. Hey, did you see this this morning? I just posted it. U.S. Senator Kelly Ayotte will officiate the wedding of Ariana Brown, the daughter of Republican Senate candidate Scott Brown, on Sunday, tomorrow, according mm-hmm. to WMUR. Mm-hmm. Ayotte endorsed Brown in late May, and the two have joked that the other is their wingman, or would be if Brown wins the GOP primary and defeats U.S. Senator Gene Shaheen in November. I led with happy couple has just taken on a new layer of nuance. <laughs> oh. it, it's just just beyond belief, frankly. Well, it does tend to show you that once you get into that club, and they do refer to it as a club, once you're in, you're always a member. And just look at all of the shenanigans that are coming to light by uh, an independent reporter by the name of Charles Johnson ha- coming out of Mississippi. And Kelly Ayotte was a contributor to Thad Cochran, who turned around and called his... Uh, and people allied with him called Chris uh, Daniels, part of the KKK, a racist and all that, and basically used every single Democrat talking point against another Republican. And then they wonder why we don't care to support Republicans anymore. No, they've got to show their principles before they wear the R, not the other way around. You know, and uh, it, it's a case where if you want us to vote for you, show us that you know our votes have value instead of just demanding absolute um, lockstep. Right. And by the way, let's, let's just draw a contrast here because the Senate is the most exclusive club in the world, although I think it's more like a roach motel. Once you get in, they won't let you out. Uh, no matter how fossilized you are, they have to carry you out in a box like um, Robert Byrd. Uh, but in contrast... Eric Cantor didn't enjoy those kind of protections. He spent a bunch of money, it's true. Uh, but nobody rallied around when they thought that he might be in danger in his primary, and he lost big to the Brat, David Brat, a real, honest-to-goodness economics professor who actually knows what it's all about. You know what I just realized? Hmm. We don't have the live stream post up. Well, it's live streaming somewhere. <laughs> on Ustream. It is live streaming on Granite Rock, just in places that you're not looking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's been one of those weeks, man. Yeah. Just not like only last was week. It... Next week, we vow to get it right. Yeah. And well, just like the door remains locked. You know what? Of our it's George there. Bush's fault. Oh. 
<laughs> anyway. Okay. So, um, well, aside from the Patriot Act. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and let's kill the uh, free marketplace to protect the free marketplace or something like that. That rerun of the Vietnam War. Uh, we have to burn the village to the ground to save it. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Then one of those days, one of those weeks, one of those years, one of those decades, yeah, one well, of those centuries so it's far. It's not going to get much better if you notice. I put up a data point. Business dynamism is down. We have always been known as being the, the freest, most dynamic economy in the world that the whole phrase of creative destruction has been one uppermost in one of our economic principles. But now what I showed was that new startups is way, way down compared to that of 20 years ago. And that's not a good thing, folks, because without those startups, you don't get the big businesses. But it's really a net effect of seeing big government forming alliances with big uh, businesses for crony capitalism, which you you know the businesses use the government to squeeze out all competition. And you have a hard time in, if unless you're in an unregulated environment like you've mentioned in the past Mike yeah, exactly. that you can't you can't do these startups no and, and any any place where you're constructing something or selling uh, stuff direct to the public you uh, even cooking you're so heavily regulated that it's almost impossible to start a new business uh, hotels uh, transportation Look at the things that are being done to Lyft and Uber in cities around the country where there are basically web-based, app-based transportation services that uh, don't have taxi medallions, aren't controlled by the taxi cab companies in the cities. They're not part of the cronyism, and so they must be killed. Uh, I, I mean... This stuff is going on all over. It happens at the town and city level. It happens at the state level. It happens at the federal level, and it does reduce dynamism. You know, the kind of businesses I've been fortunate enough to be in are not regulated. They're started by a handful of people with a bright idea. The money typically comes to the bright idea after, you know, without too much uh, delay. And, in fact, <coughs> we're the beneficiaries, believe it or not, of this current environment Talking with our CEO recently, he said, what is happening is there's a shift down market of the investors, investment strata. The angel investors are looking for smaller and smaller startups. The, uh, the venture capitalists are going where the, where the angel investors used to go. And the big banks that used to take you public are coming in pre-public to try and go where the VCs used to go. Why? Because they're looking for value. There's no value in the market. The market's overinflated. The Fed's, Fed's printing has ruined everything. There's no return on bonds. So the search for companies that might actually be growing uh, is is so intense that there's actually money sloshing around if you've got a good idea. But if you're starting up in any kind of regulated environment, you don't have a prayer. Yeah. Speaking of prayers, that starts with P, which also starts Push poles. <laughs> Push poles. And you, well, uh, there's been a little bit there on Granite Rock. I got some uh, some some constituents reached out to me and said, "Hey, I'm not in CD2, so I don't get the phone call for this survey that was being conducted." Um, and it turns out it was paid for by the Lambert campaign, Gary Lambert for Congress, and it. Uh, asked some, made some glorifying statements about the congressman. And um, as I pointed out, there are some glorifying things to point out to a man who was a Marine colonel and, and has served his country. He's certainly done some good things, and, and he, should be, he should be rewarded for that, and it should be spoken out loud, and that can't be the end of it, however, because no. the poll continues, and it begins to ask these, uh, infers negative situations and their effect on your opinion of his opponent. So this is a push poll. It's not the quick snap 60 second, um, if you heard so-and-so robbed a bank, how would you feel better, worse, etc., and then quick, it's gone. This is a longer poll. I don't know exactly how long because I don't have a recording of it. Uh, I was told it's nearly a half hour. Uh, the what? Pers- the person who offered the opinion of it uh, to me on Thursday night said that uh, she believed that uh, part of the uh, ploy was to leave the paid-for buy until the very end, which is where it was, uh, in the hope that most people wouldn't even know who had paid for it. They, they were actually have uh, – I have a person who sent me an email on the record 
they didn't want me to give their name, but I have the email if I need it that said that they specifically that she asked repeatedly who's paying for this poll, and they they said we can't tell you till the end. Ooh. So you had to wait until the end of the poll. Now, before you get to the end of the poll, you are asked some questions about the opponent, Marilyn de Garcia, um, and and there's a lot of negative light about her. They say she supported things that Obama was funding. They say that she's basically, what would you think if she was pro-amnesty, blah, 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 things like that. And I have that generalizing. But um, basically, they wanted to get your opinion of the other candidate based on these negative assumptions about her record or things they claim about her record. Now, I've asked the campaign to respond, and they, they have said that they will, but they have not. And I was out there, you know, the Lambert campaign said, it's not a push-pull, that would be illegal. And then, of course, my response was, well, that's not the point. The point is that it's a push-pull in spirit and in principle, even though it doesn't violate the statute. So... Um, and, you know, and maybe he did pay a third party to go out and and do what they can to influence opinion, uh, and maybe the third party crossed the line. I don't know. I find it hard to believe that a man of such character would well, that's would, the would, question. would deliberately request this, but the, the content of it is undeniable. We've had reports from more than one location, and, and that's, that's most unfortunate. It is because he's a great guy, and I do have to wonder if he really knew what they were going to do or how, who knew. When that sort of thing, um, it, it's... and, and let, you know, let's just take immigration. You were at my house on Tuesday night. Marilyn spoke, uh, and uh, frankly, in that size setting, she did better than she even does in slightly larger ones. Absolutely, answers from the heart. Uh, a bit Karen Testament-ish, except I think she's actually going to stands a good chance of winning her primary. Um, but you know, all answers from the heart, wouldn't you say? I would say, yeah. I mean, she she spoke for a while. Uh, she answered every question. Um, she didn't dodge anything, as far as I can tell. You know, I wasn't always paying attention every second because I was kind of moving around and, and, and getting food. And I admit mm-hmm. that I was eating while she was talking. But um, I'm going to see if I have the uh, the implications that I know I posted them. So go to granitegrock.com, right, right. see if you can find them on there. I did mention what they were, and I don't seem to be able to see them right at this second. Right, so. and yeah, you know, and we've had Gary Lambert on, and we've interviewed him, and he oh, we'll a, have him on again, absolutely. And, 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 yeah, and he does, and he does a good interview, and he's very firm in his positions, and I would say he's actually firmed up some of his positions. Uh, you know, and uh, I wouldn't have any problem if he was a nominee. Uh, the thing is, you know, where did this poll come from? And as I say, was did the uh, polling organization go rogue on him? Okay, here we go. Uh, Maryland apparently supports Obamacare and giving money to companies like Solyndra. This is not direct quotes. This is paraphrasing. Favors amnesty and wants to give money to immigrants to support Obama. Missed some astronomical number of New Hampshire House votes. She uh, did miss some votes. I went and looked. Um, I don't have the exact number. I know that she voted on 86% of what HR, the New Hampshire House Republican Alliance, considers to be important platform votes. So she missed 14% of those. Uh, and let us just remember there's a part-time legislature. Nobody's paid to be there. Uh, everybody makes it on a best effort basis. They with- get 100 bucks. just for those of you who aren't aware. It's not much. <laughs> It certainly doesn't cover the cost of transportation unless you live next door. That's well, they, they, the, they get, get per diem. They get per diem. But the point is, is it's not – the point is, is that they're legislating because they choose to and they've been elected, not because they're paid to. Yes. That's what we want in our citizen legislature. We don't want them to go for the money. We want them to go for the ideas and the job itself of actually doing that task of being a legislator. And, and, and let, let me just uh, place uh, – you know, uh, make the other point, the other side of the equation for a moment. You have 20 uh, seconds. And that is that <laughs> Colonel Lambert has stated very forcefully and unequivocally on more than one occasion he would not want to be paid a salary in Congress nor take a pension. He thinks well, he that, already has a pension. Yeah, he, he, but all right. And he's probably got some business earnings. The thing is, I think he's, he's right. I think if you go there to earn money from it, you're do, doing it for the wrong reasons. And I agree that that's fine. That he, I, I, Not just because he's a colonel in the Marines and he's getting a pension, because he already has one. But the, the, that's a good point. The fact that he's like, well, I'm not going to take more. I'm not going to take more money, more pension, because... Now, that's that's the right move either yes. way. And, and once again, we're not attacking him specifically. We're attacking this poll and the, the principle behind it. So that's this week's episode. 
program, whatever you want to call it, of Grok Talk, whether you saw it or not, because I didn't put the live stream feed up. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But it'll be on podcast, and we'll be back next week with more news, more guests, and more Grok Talk. And I'll be phoning in from California. Okay, bye. This episode of Grok Talk was originally recorded on July 12, 2014. All the original ads and content remain intact, but it has been edited to fit our new programming format. When asked whether she still supports Obamacare, Senator Jean Shaheen said, Yes, I do continue to support the law. We're beginning to see some positive results. How can Senator Shaheen say we're seeing positive results when 22,000 of our neighbors have already lost their health insurance? What's worse, the Boston Globe reports the state's only health insurance provider radically reduced the number of hospitals in their network, forcing some people to drive over an hour for lab work, even when there's a hospital within a few miles of their home. When pressed about lack of access, Shaheen said... There are some hospitals that are not covered, unfortunately, and um, I, I certainly hope that's going to change. Jean Shaheen promised us we could keep our doctors and our health care coverage. Now she hopes we can get to a local hospital? Call Senator Shaheen at 603-647-7500. Tell her we need more than hope. We need leadership. Paid for by Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. This is Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. We're located at 8 North Main in Concord, New Hampshire. This is a repository for all things conservative and municipal. So if you have a problem in your town, your school, your budget committee, the right to know law, and now at the top of our list is voter fraud. you have a tip for us, some information for us, you want to join or help us out, cnht.org.